Welcome to Tribe Stories. My name is Aaron Mashano, entrepreneur and chief of the Tribe Hut. And each month we bring you an inspiring person or a message with a hope to equip, connect and collaborate with you to help you on your journey to doing remarkable things. Thanks for spending some time with me today and thank you so much for finding our tribe. Now let the sharing begin. Welcome, guys, to another episode of Tribe Stories. Uh, again, my name is Aaron Mashano. I'm here with, I would say, the legendary, and I mean this not lightly, Robert Estone. He actually is a person that helped me get started in my journey here in Bali about five years ago, running some events, and we were supporting for a good cause. I won't steal the story, but this man has been around the world. He's helped, contributed, uh, run bands, to have done just an extraordinary life and now he's here in Bali uh, helping a lot of people that I need making such a massive impact and has a tremendous story that is really really unusual and I know one you guys would love to learn about so Robert thank you very much for joining us on Tribe Stories today really appreciate you being here. It's a very kind introduction I don't know whether I live up to that. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think you do, plus more, and many people say so. So uh, just to kick off with a bit of an introduction then, I know we'll get into a bit of your journey and and people can get a sense of not just uh, what you do, but who you are. But can we maybe start off with the very unusual brand called Soman, and maybe tell us how did that brand come about and how long ago did you get that uh, brand started? It's actually a mistake, but it's something I can't change now because it's got a lot of brand recognition. Um, I, after I moved to Bali from living in Shanghai, my wife and I went back to Shanghai for a holiday and a friend of ours, a British film producer, was walking around Shanghai without shoes. And he was calling himself the Soul Man. The reason was he was uh, documenting a film, uh, really a, a year in the life of somebody wearing, going barefoot raising money for libraries for poor children. And when I came back to Bali, I was still considering what to do here because I was on a retirement visa. And I thought, I really like that idea. I love the idea of going without shoes. Number one, because it's very grounding. Number two, because it's very naughty. And I'm really quite naughty and have been anyway. And I thought, that's true. That's what I'll do. Um, I was thinking of forming a charity and I was fortunate enough to have raised a I've met um, a guy in our Rotary Club who was a Manku, a Hindu priest and a businessman, and I asked him to form the charity. He was also one of the leaders of the Democratic Party, the leading party here. And, um, I, I, and we called it Soul Man. Really, it, it's actually, it should be Soul Family or Soul People. It's a bit sexist, but as I said, I can't change, it's too late to stop now. But soul men, yeah. Soul, as in the soul, obviously, and the soul of your feet. That was the right. Idea. So tell me, I know a lot of people don't know this, but you may not even remember you told me the story five years ago, and it stuck with me. You said you sometimes go through airports and have different experiences because you refuse to wear shoes. Could you maybe share with us what actually happens with your dedication to the soul purpose, and uh, how does that show up in your day-to-day life? Yeah, well, to preempt that, I ought to say that actually went without shoes. I made a public declaration I would go without shoes uh, until I'd raised four, uh, one million dollars for the charity. Something I did about four years ago. You know, yes. the money comes in, goes out, and we do it. Um, going through airports, Congratulations. a couple of interesting things. I think uh, once I was getting on the Singapore flight, Singapore Airlines flight. Um, and the stewardess stopped me at the top of the ladder and she said, uh, you can't come on without, without sandals, she said. I stuck in my head, without shoes. I said, well, I have a ticket. I don't believe you've got a rule to say that people can't come on without shoes. If you can show me the rule, and I've done my research, I'll, 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 uh, I'll wear a pair of shoes or I'll get off the plane. So she looked a bit dumbfounded. I said, I tell you what, why don't we ask the 150 people behind me if they don't mind waiting perhaps an hour or so while you collect the rule book and prove me wrong. Oh, she said, come on. (laughs) At the end, we landed into Singapore and the captain came out and he made a beeline straight for me. And I thought, oh shit, I'm gonna get into trouble now. 
and he said, gave me an envelope. He said, I've collected money from the crew. I've checked up on who you are and what you're doing. And would it be okay to have a picture of you and I in front of the plane? Wow, wow. A few months later, Singapore Airlines contacted me and said, look, we've got a lot of uh, fairly new uh, furniture in our office, which, which, which we don't need. Would, would you like it? And they refurnished our office. Oh. And Andy said, what's more, we'd like to put your collection boxes at some of our terminals. So, you know, from being very naughty and all the rest of it, the whole thing turned around. Um, wow. Yeah, that was, that was the most interesting, I think, of the airlines. There have been a few of them. Mm, They've been I... thrown out of cinemas and restaurants. Many times waitresses have run out of the restaurant with my shoes, or not my shoes, with their uh, yelling, excuse me, sir, I think you left your shoes behind. <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and that really stuck with me. Five years I've been thinking. And when you said naughty, I'm like, damn straight is naughty, because that's the story I connected to. So we had to share that with the audience. And, and just that serendipitous effect. But what do you, what do you think makes you... Uh, true ambassador of Soman, whereas I, I know from some of your biography and the research I did, a lot of people have come on and off your journey in the last decade where you're helping disadvantaged uh, people with disabilities here in Bali, but uh, people have gone on the Soman journey and represented it with no shoes and then all of a sudden they don't stay on. So what do you think are your maybe strengths or attributes that make you stand out and also stand against the uh, status quo, if you like, and actually get some of these things to give you some positive results. What, what do you think uh, those, those might be? I think really, um, I started Soul Men by declaring I would go without shoes until we'd raise the money. And I wanted to do that to establish credibility. In Bali at that time, 11 years ago, uh, I was told 75% of the uh, NGOs orphanages in particular, were run as illegal businesses. And I thought, who the hell's gonna believe this? I was then 60 odd years old, uh, fellow with long hair and no shoes. How, why would they believe him? So I decided to do a walk around Bali, a barefoot walk around Bali, and give health checks and health presentations at villages that had never seen a doctor. And I thought, you know, that may establish credibility. And we managed to collect about 23 fil uh, YouTube films on that. We had two TV stations and a couple of film companies following us. I think it's my honesty wow. that comes through. Um, I, nor, neither I nor Sarah Chapman, my head of outreach uh, and really co-founder of the, of the charity have ever taken a salary in 10 years. I, I, it's unheard of. It's, yeah. I'm completely mad, actually. It's not a sensible thing to have done. <laughs> we started this, we weren't thinking about earning money from it, and we just got, just got immersed in it. And, and, and it, it, from one child, it's become two and a half thousand people. And we just lost sight of ever actually wanting to take money from it. And then it became too late because we couldn't afford to. It was not a sensible thing to do in hindsight, because you know I've got to think of the future and I need replacing at some point, and there's got to be money there for somebody else, and there's no precedent. But anyway, that's who I am, and that's what I did, and, and you know, money, but to me, wasn't terribly important. I, I could live off my savings and everything else. That's uh, changed considerably since the pandemic, but, you know, I, I've got, I'm doing what I'm doing, and I don't have any regrets. Yeah. Uh, I think I had an experience a few weeks ago with a very famous guy from a very famous company. Uh, and tell us story. I, don't wanna, I, I don't want to mention who it is because yeah. I haven't got permission from him. That's fine. That's fine. And I decided I would do a short video on the beach. And the, you know, I'd like to invite you to Bali for whatever reason. And please come and see what we do and all the rest of it. And I didn't really expect a reply, but I went to see Chokache, the uh, vice governor who calls me bro by the way sends me messages bro what you do and i said look I like do me that. a favor i don't i don't expect this guy he doesn't know me from adam to reply to me but could you do a video too and just invite him because it's very important and i think i i, I really 
I want to try and get some funding from him. He said, it'll be a pleasure. Anyway, I didn't hear from him. Until a week later, he sent me this fabulous video of him behind his desk. And I said, please dress up in all your ceremonial things and everything. Um, and he did it. And I sent that off to the guy. And the same morning or the following morning, I get an email. He said, look, you know how many emails I get every day asking me for money? You won't believe it. But I've never had <laughs> such a couple of emails uh, from anybody. And, and I'm intrigued. Can we speak? When? So I said, tomorrow. He said, fine. What time? And I said, 8.30 my time in the evening, 7.30 your time in America. And we talked. And I started telling him about the charity. And he stood stop there. I said, oh, what, what's the matter? He said, I've researched the charity. I've looked at your website. I don't want to talk about the charity. I want to talk about you. And we talked for an hour. And it was like talking to an old friend. It was so wonderful. My mind was completely off asking him for money. And he sat back in his chair just before the end of the hour. And I thought, oh my God, look, you know, I haven't done anything. I haven't made my pitch. What am I going to do? And he said, um, what do you actually want? So I said, well, you know, we're, we're running out of money um, in, in literally a couple of weeks. We can't pay our rent. We got money coming at the end of the year. Um, we, we've got grants in place and all the rest of it, but I need a bridge. I need a bridge to the end of the year or to whenever the tourists are coming back, but who knows when the tourists are coming back. And he sat back in his chair and he said, well, how much do you reckon you need? And I told him, he said, fine, but you know, I can't put this through my company, well-known company, global international company. He said, because to do that, I'd have to call a board meeting. They may may not pass it, I have not completely autonomous, I can't overrule the whole company. And I sense it's urgent. And if I put this through the company, you're gonna to have to be sent reams of paper and fill out applications and everything, and there's no time. Tomorrow morning, I'm sending you $50,000. Wow, wow. Now That's this was somebody I'd never met before, knew nothing about, uh, uh, and you know, I, I was just blown away. And that got me thinking, oh, maybe there are more so and so. Absolutely. Of course there are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the yeah. way to reach them, to actually reach them from my heart, from my, dare I say it without being pompous or anything, my humanitarian heart, I would reach them. And I uh -huh. think I can do that. Uh -huh. and, and that's the person. I'm, you know, I'm not that brilliant with figures or with anything else. I'm, I'm good with people, I'm honest. Um, I've got a proven track record. We've got a great reputation. Um, we, we, we've been white and white since we started 11 years ago. And that, I think, answers the question. Yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely I one of them. I on that, obviously. I think, I think what, you, one of you, yeah. what I'm hearing you say, and after, like you said, a lot of Yaya Sans, or I think they call them NGOs, charities here, uh, run illegally in the fact that you're white on white and you're honest. I think that carries through in these instances a way you're also being a bit naughty, so to speak. And I think this is really a compelling story in itself. And the fact that you've been doing it for 11 years without a salary, and I know Sarah's in the same boat. I mean, that's, that's, that speaks a lot of volumes. And I think that sincerity comes through without you needing to mention it to people like that, who probably deal with thousands and thousands of applications every day, as you said. And uh, that story is a really inspiring one. And I think something that a lot of people in your space need to hear because a lot of people go, well, COVID is here. There's no money now. Nobody's going to support us. And then there's, here's you sharing an authentic story and actually getting people to connect with it. So that's, that's powerful. But you're about to share something. I'm very fortunate. I've, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm very, very fortunate. We, we've got the most extraordinary, passionate and dedicated team, loyal uh -huh. team. Uh -huh. And quite frankly, oh, Sarah Chapman for me has completely fallen out of heaven. I've never met uh, anybody like that. Uh, why do you say that? Anyone. Why do you say that? Why do I say that? Just, yeah, there are thousands of examples, but one from many, many years ago, maybe a year after we started, was we found a guy up in Tab North Tabernan. He'd fallen out of a coconut tree. He was in hospital and they wouldn't, they refused to, they refused to, 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 to attend to him unless he paid, I think it was the equivalent of $1,100 up front. He'd broken his back. 
and they just left him on a trolley. And somebody called us and told us, and she and I went up in a rented car. We didn't have our own car by then. And we brought him back to, to Denpasar and we went around all the hospitals, not all the hospitals, we went around about four or five or six hospitals. Nobody would take him. Nobody would take him. He didn't have the PPJS. It all needed $1,100. We didn't have that at the time. And Sarah said, look, I'll take him home. What are we going to do? We can't take him back. So she put him wow. in her bed. She lived in a one-room place. She put him in her bed. She slept on the floor. The wife slept on the floor. He peed in the bed. In the morning, I went round to collect them, and we did the rounds again. We managed to get him into BIMC. I think BIMC knew Sadur at that time. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it was. But that's the sort of person she is, and that story could be told many times over. She's right. I, I'm so honoured to be uh -huh. working with her. You can wow. tell in my voice. I'm, I'm, it, 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 it's, yeah. I'm so fortunate, you know, and yeah. that's such a joy. Yeah. Not only her, but the, the team are like that. Uh -huh. They really are. Uh -huh. it, 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 you know, I, hey, there's no money in, for me, but the joy of working with people like this is beyond any salary or anything like that. Where would you get this? You can't buy that sort of thing. Uh, you really can't. Wow. wow. That's why I'm doing it. That's why I continue to do it at 72 years old. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> I'm supposed to be in Bali. And 10 years ago, I was supposed to be retired, living by the beach, playing guitar, painting, doing whatever. What the hell am I doing? I've never worked this hard in my life. Why? I... And for nothing. <laughs> Got into shit from my wife because you know eventually I had to borrow money from her. Yeah. You know what am I doing? I had a company. I I wasn't paying attention. I was doing this. Mm. You know, but I don't feel any regrets. Mm. I really don't. Mm. That's that actually it's really beautiful about the regret. But I was going to ask you this question. So imagine you were uh, talking to your former self, your past self. You know what? What would you say you've learned? in this journey up to today of being the leader that you are, that you might better advise your younger self, maybe what are the three lessons or takeaways or experiences that you would guide your, I, that I think on the negative side, I have to mention this, that I've been irresponsible. I've been irresponsible to myself, to my wife, to my family in taking my eye off the ball and not earning money for over a decade and putting myself in this position. On the other hand, I can die happy knowing that I've left a legacy. I've done, I've been responsible for, for doing what we're doing right now. We've changed so many lives. We've saved so many lives. We've made such a difference and you can't buy things like that. And I would urge people to do whatever is in their heart. You know, sometimes life takes you on a different journey on the left side or the right side, which side shall I go? And I think possibly, you know, when I turned 50, I woke up one morning and I was working for a, a raincoat company in London. Can you imagine ma manufacturing raincoats? I can't London, imagine in, that. In Thailand, yes, I was. I, I was actually, in I, was, I was in charge of the men's division of, the, of this company. And... Uh, it was a great job. It was easy for me. I was designing stuff. I hired a, a very well-known designer to do it for me. I said to the chairman of the company, I don't want to have a salary. I want to go on commission. I ended up earning more than he did. He was the chairman and the owner. Um, I said to him, look, I'd like to, we, we, we really swamped the UK market. And I said to him, I'd like to go and show in Paris, in New York, in Tokyo. He said, you go wherever you want, I'll fund it. And wherever I went, I did it. So wow. I was having a great time. But I woke up on my 50th birthday saying, oh, a cold sweat. What am I going to put on my epitaph? He was a raincoat salesman. You know, if anybody said, what do you do? I'd say, I'm in the fashion business. But this uh, voice in my head would say, by the way, you're a raincoat salesman. And uh, while I was waiting from one overseas trip to the other, I would drive in my car to some tiny little shop in the middle of the country somewhere with six raincoats over my hand, wait in the waiting room, 
until he brought to agree or whatever. I was just, yeah. And people used to say to me, I can't believe what you're doing. You're, a man like you, you, you're worth much more than this. What are you doing? So I woke up on my 50th birthday and I thought I have got to make a difference in my life. And I just started chanting. I'm a Buddhist chanter, the SGI chanter. Yeah, I was gonna bring that up. Yeah, my Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. That's what I was chanting. And I decided I would chant to make a difference in the world. I didn't know how, but I would do something. And it came very, very quickly. Uh, the, 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 the war in Yugoslavia, and I was, I, and I saw one of my, not my factories, one of my supplier factories going up in smoke. And I decided I would have raised money for the refugees there. And I heard of a warehouse in Leeds, actually, where I come from, that was full of baby's milk going off. There was an expiry on it. And I decided I would have a, uh, I would have a, an exhibition. I, I found out where there was an exhibition going on and I, I, I got a free stand and I went around all my designer friends in London and I got them to give me, uh, like Paul Smith would give me jackets that I would sell at 15 pounds that were really 200 pounds or Vivian West would give me dresses that were a few thousand dollars I would sell at 120 or whatever it was. And I raised 20,000 pounds over two days and I rented a, a, a truck, a container with a truck, a 60 foot container, and went up to Leeds, collected the milk and drove it down to Bari in Italy, and then over the border into Albania, into the former Yugoslavia. That night, while we were waiting to, to leave in the morning, we heard that the uh, terrorists were coming over the border to, 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 to kill us, basically. So we had to get out very quickly, but at least we'd we left the milk with the Albanians for them to deliver later on when we got back. Um, that was the first thing I did. And then wow. when, I came, when I came back, the Prince Vladimir of Yugoslavia held this big, big reception. Thank you very much for doing what you've been doing for my people. And then the next thing that happened was, uh, I, 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 oh, I don't know how long have I got, but anyway, I, I was chanting to do something else. I, wanted, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do, but I, was standing by the side of the road to go into the tube station uh, to go to my Buddhist meeting. And I, I thought, what are you doing? I, I've got a tube pass, it's free. Why am I standing waiting for a taxi? And it was in the rain, there's no way a taxi is gonna come in the rain. A taxi turned up, I got the, or opened the car door and I got pushed out of the way and actually landed on the pavement by this big bear of a man who got into my taxi. I scrambled into the taxi next to him and he said, fuck off out of my taxi. This is not your taxi, it's my... So I said, look, it's raining, where are you going? He said, uh, I'm going to Kensington. So I said, well, I'm going to Knightsbridge, I'm, we'll share the taxi. In the taxi, I said, by the way, what do you do apart from complain? He said, um, I... Uh, I like I, that. Yeah, he said, I run a charity, at which point I nearly, you know, my hairs were going up on my arms. I said, what is it about? He said, you wouldn't be interested. You know, the way I looked, perhaps, what didn't go for me. Um, I said, I'm really interested. I really could love to, to do something. And he sensed there was some sort of sincerity there. And he came to my office the next day and he said, well, what can you do? And I said, I think I can do anything, really. What do you want to do? What do you, want, what do you need? He said, I need to, I need to, con I need press. I need to contact, you know, I need to get the word out. I said, word out about what? He said, we're making a film, we're taking some of the world's top um, musicians and actors and actresses over to Peru. Peru, I don't know whether you know this, was a, a being oh. run by the Luminoso the Shining Path at that time, yeah. 1990, 1991. Uh, and the, it, there was a deforestation issue as well as the, the, the Shining Path murdering people. And the BBC were taking a crew to uh, Peru to e expose the drug barons and the deforestation issue. And they wanted to get the word out. And they had all these people signed up to go. He said, the thing we need is publicity. So I did research and I, I sent a fax in those days, or it could have been a telex, even you wouldn't uh -huh. remember. What it was. Oh, and no, they're still working in Africa right now. <laughs> so I, I, I found out that the, that the paper with the biggest circulation around the world 
was a Japanese paper, I think it was called the Asahi Shimbun or something. It went to Japanese offices around the world, of which there were that many. They had more distribution of any newspaper than any newspaper in the world. So I contacted the editor, the environmental editor, and I said, do you want to come to Peru? This is what we're doing, BBC, blah, blah. Um, uh, and it's all paid for, but would you come on the trip and write the story? He said, yes, immediately. Oh my God, it's fantastic. So I told wow. this guy, this guy's name was Christopher Tate. He was from the Tate and Lyle family, which is a, a, a British family that owned huge sugar company. And the guy said, oh, and then I, I got a, a, a UK presenter, a guy called Jeff Banks, another fashion designer to come. Uh, he had an audience of about 45 million. I said, will you come? You can do a story on alpaca or something. He came. So Chris Tate said to me, God, you've done more than I've done or anybody's done in, in the last three months. You know, I want you on the trip. Okay. That's great. So well, I got on the trip, but I was very nervous. I was very, very, I wasn't confident. I had all these incredible luminaries on the trip and I felt very out of my depth. What am I going to talk about with them? And all the rest of it. Anyway, about a month before we set off, the biggest outbreak break of cholera the world's ever seen broke down the coastline of Peru and all their agents pulled everybody out of the trip. So we had nobody. So we had an emergency meeting. We said, okay, what are we going to do? We get valuable people. Uh, people, scientists, botanists, uh, environmentalists. We had a we had a plane load, one plane load of these people. We had uh, a guy called David Bellamy. I don't know whether you've heard of him in in, in Britain. We had the uh, head of CNN in, of, of the environment, CNN division. We had um, oh all sorts of people like that, valuable people, scientists who could actually do something rather than just pretty, pretty faces and things. And we set off, but Chris Tate actually wasn't very honest. And I can say this openly because he, 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 he admitted this afterwards, that uh, we were going into our, to face our deaths because the Luminoso knew very well about this BBC film crew coming to expose them. And after a few days of, of doing stuff in Peru, flying oh. over the Nazca lines and seeing all this, we, the guy said, look, let's film Robert at the top of Machu Picchu, banging his gong and doing his chanting in the morning great make it just really good so we set off and i don't know whether you've ever been to machu picchu there's no not yet not yet it's on my train, bucket list well there's a train track with a cliff on one side and a drop on the other side and uh, the pass we were set off at four o'clock in the morning and they set up uh, set a passenger ex express train a train to hit us and we're going along on a sort of workers trolley vehicle really basically and I suddenly saw in front of us this bolt of light coming round a corner and straight for us. And it was very obvious that we'd be killed. It was a head-on collision coming. And they sent this engine to, to kill us. Apparently this has happened a number of times in the past. And normally what happened was it, it, it knocked the other vehicle down the cliff. But in our case, it didn't. It hit us and we just were propelled backwards at a, a ridiculous speed. And our vehicle just went like that. So the guy at the back, who was the head of CNN environment, and the guy at the front, the guy who wrote the Prince's Trust with Prince Charles for the environment, were both MS, not killed, but virtually every bone in their body were broken. Actually, the guy at the back was killed, but the fellow at the front, um, oh. I can't remember his name, um, was in bad shape. Anyway, finally, I don't know, but somehow these guys were over, uh, were, were stopped and the vehicle stopped and it had just concertinaed and I had chanted to be useful. I still wasn't very confident, but I chanted to be useful on this trip. And I was the only person with the use of their legs. Everybody else had, there were only 12 people, a couple of died, four people died. Uh, and the rest of us, there were, wow. they, were, they were in bad shape. They couldn't, I, I got them all off the wreck put them up against the cliff and we waited for what? We didn't know. But the president, president, prime minister of, um, of Peru, uh, we, were, we were in, uh, in, in Machu Picchu, we were very, very close to, to where he was. And he sent his private helicopter. It's all documented. It's, I've got the, 
some of the footage on my computer. Um, he sent his private helicopter to fly us to Cusco, to hospital, where another two people died. And uh, I was quite bad shape, but, um, and, and then I was flown to, to Florida, to another hospital, and finally to England, where I nearly had my leg amputated because they couldn't figure out what, what was the problem. I had some wow. jungle infection that nobody knew about. Wow. But that was my first humanitarian experience. Oh my goodness. And from then, we didn't do anything. We didn't take the film to the Earth Summit in Rio in, that, in 1992 or whatever it was, because there wasn't a film. It was just odd bits of footage, the footage of, the, of what happened, but that wasn't very useful for them. But it, 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 it started me. My uh, parents had always been humanitarians. Uh, my father was honored by Prince Philip. I've got a letter from Prince Philip to my mother there uh, saying, you know, what a great guy. He was so sorry he'd heard that he died and it was tragic and everything else. So they, they'd, in, they'd imbued in, in me uh, humanity, really. The door in our house was always open for waifs and strays or whoever my mother had found that needed help. So we yeah. never quite knew who was living in the house. <laughs> wow, that sounds like an African hammock. Actually, I was going to ask you that question on that note, just to, not to segue from the story, but the people that have actually inspired you to become the man that you are. So you mentioned your father, your mom, and that was because what, what, what was their line of work and, and how did that mold you, you think? Because that was really interesting. I was well, going to ask you that. My father was, uh, my father was um, um, a, a, a clothier. He had a, a clothing factory, my grandfather's clothing factory. My father developed um, um, programs for the youth in Leeds, where we lived, and he, 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 he built this huge center, which was a center where uh, underprivileged children could go and be taught and empowered and all sorts of things. Uh -huh. And Prince Philip heard about it. I don't know how, but um, he, he said, would you mind calling it the Prince Philip Playing Fields? Or can we call the playing fields attached? Mm -hmm. Prince Field. There's a bus still with my father's name that goes around Leeds picking kids up. Wow. That was my father. And my mother was, um, as I've just described her, and, and, and a concert pianist. She was an absolutely very multi-talented woman. So I was, I was very fortunate. Um, and I don't know who else... Uh, I, Sarah Chapman has inspired me. You know, yeah, when I started, I, yeah. I didn't intend to start a charity. I never intended to do that. I came here to relax and to have fun. Sarah's fault, I'll tell her. <laughs> I read about her on Facebook. There was this woman who was going on the back of a bus six hours a day, um, three days a week to, to, to attend to some small child in the middle of nowhere in Karangasan that needed attending to. And it kind of gripped me and I contacted her and I said, what do you need? And she said she needed a few hundred dollars to put the kid into Sangler because she needed 24 hour caring. And uh -huh. I raised the money through the Rotary Club at the time. Uh -huh. and, 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 and the rest is history quite amazing. Wow, wow. Now this is so powerful. Sarah so Chapman is the one that's inspired me. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that connection there. So she was already on the ground in Bali doing these kind of some little projects before well, you came along to join her. She came to retire as well. Okay. And, wow. and was doing Sumba, teaching Sumba or something like that. And somehow I'd heard about this child and was doing this with a, a friend of hers uh, who needed help. Uh, she had never intended to end up what she's doing now, like me. Wow. Both of them. Wow. And we were pulled in a different direction. Wow. But I, I, no regrets. So what, what do you think it actually takes for these people like your father, you mentioned, who opened up the center and then coincidentally Prince, uh, was it uh, Henry, yeah, came and supported that, Prince Philip, sorry, and then Sarah doing what she was doing and then you found her and you go off into this uh, project and then pull people off a wreck and get saved. And what, what do you think are the characteristics or what would you advise someone who is maybe trying to get into the path that you guys have chosen to make? excuse me, meaningful impact, I'd call it, but uh, what, what do you think of the characteristics it takes to actually keep going? I don't want to be, I don't want to sound like an evangelist. But no, honestly, please go speaking, ahead. This is what the show is about. <laughs> honestly speaking, it's yeah. my practice. I've been chanting for nearly 
35, 36 years. Uh, and by doing so, it empowers you. It opens up doors, it opens up windows. It, it, it really empowers people to take them in a direction. You can chant for whatever you want, but it's not all, you know, as the Rolling Stones sang, you can't always get what you want. But if you try some time, you uh, might find you get what you need. That's right. And I've got, I've got what I needed. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and, and I think it's, it's just take, you've got to listen to your heart. In my case, I listened to the universe through my chanting and, and, and through empowering myself. And, and I've seen p people's lives completely change for the better, for the positive, uh, through uh, their chanting. And it has empowered so many people. And it has empowered me. And the more I do, the more empowered I get, the more magic happens. Uh, you know, the thing with the guy, the wealthy guy a few weeks ago was just one. Uh, there have been many, many, many instances in my life. Uh, and I can tag it to the amount of chanting I've done. And I met Tina Turner years ago in London, oh, wow. and she told me exactly the same thing. I very stupidly said to her, my God, what are you on? I've never seen somebody so incredibly energetic at your age and everything else. And she said, do you don't know my history? I, you know my history. I've never, I've never done a drug. It's my chanting that's always empowered me. And I can, I can, I can almost chant my success and my strength through the amount of chanting that I've been doing. Uh, and that, and I, I, I would say the same thing. Uh, um, you, I, I can't explain it. It's just something that you do, you try, right. and you watch right. what happens. Just on that, because I... I, uh, I have to say well, one thing, yeah, one more oh, thing. Yeah, I'm this is very cool. That's fine. During the time that, uh, that, that I saw death in my face, when the, when the vehicle okay. was coming to me, I screaming out, nam yo renge kyo, nam yo renge kyo, nam yo renge kyo. And I thought I was really annoying everybody, you know, on the, on the truck. But I, I, it gave me no fear. I knew we were going to be killed. I mean, thank God we weren't killed. Uh, six people were killed, but, or four first, and then the two. But I, I, I came out of it, but I had no fear. And I, I, I was kind of interested. I'd heard that you see your life going before you, but it didn't yeah. happen. I was a bit disappointed in that, but anyway, <laughs> but I was so happy that I was about to be killed. If I had to be killed and lose my life, I was going to lose my life with these wonderful people, this group of bodhisattvas, these uh, fabulous people doing good uh, for the uh, world. And I felt very honored. Wow. During, during my lung surgery last year, I chanted when I was going into the operating theater and I felt no fear whatsoever. Uh, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a foregone conclusion at all. You know, when I woke up and, and the nurse said to me, um, I said to the nurse, am I going to live? And she said, it's up to you. Wow. It's up to you. Wow. I had this strength that I knew I could I could get through it. Uh, uh. Could you maybe, because we only have about 10 minutes or so, but maybe just for the audience, just sure. a little bit of a summary of what is the actual chant that you use that you feel uh, gives you this confidence or courage or, or faith? Uh, just so maybe some people might be interested to have something to start with. What would you say could help them? Just a summary version. I, I, I've got it on a, on a bracelet here. You probably don't, can't see it, but it says Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. Yeah, yeah, we can Nam see that. Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. Nam, Nam is, an, is an honorific. I, I honor. Myoho is the mystic law. Kyo, a Renge is the law of cause and effect. And Kyo is the link, linking uh -huh. it all together. Basically, Myoho Renge Kyo is the title of the last sutra that Shakyamuni Buddha wrote. The, the original Buddha wrote, and he said, this is, this is the meaning of life. Chantam Yohorengi Kyo. Uh, and basically, we believe that chanting Nam Yohorengi Kyo, the title of the Lotus Sutra, is, is, is really chanting the whole of the 52 chapters of the Lotus Sutra. Uh -huh. and, the, and it's something that is, you can't explain it. It's not, you can't intellectualize it. it it's something you do and it works. Uh -huh. You can uh -huh. try it. To hell with it. Let's see if it works. Cost nothing. Yeah. See what so, happens. It's, it's that's amazing. So who actually? Magic. Yeah, by yeah. Any means. It's a ritual. It's a ritual, isn't it? Yeah. So who actually introduced you? 
Yeah, it's not, okay. It's not religion or anything like that. It's a faith. It's a practice. Mm -hmm. And as I say, I've seen so many people who've changed their lives doing this. Mm -hmm. And it saved my life. It saved my life. I, I could have died in, in KL on, on the, with the surgery if I'd have given up. It was very hard to breathe. And I was thinking of, oh, well, look, I've done what I've done. I, I, do I really need this? I, I kind of go now. I think I've done enough. But I, I couldn't let my kids down. And I needed to survive. So I chanted it strongly and I got my power back. And I, and I was fine. I was 11 days in intensive care, but I was fine. I was strong. Wow. Wow. Robert, you mentioned your kids and you needed to survive for them. What, what did you mean by that? Well, my kids I've hardly seen in 20 years. It's awful. Really, it's terrible. But my, we, we talk all the time and I see them once a year for a few days in England. I'm terribly proud of my kids. Uh. My daughter runs a charity called Prexstock, if you put yeah, that into the I checked it out, yeah. Prexstock is, is empowering, uh, uh, mentoring children with, uh, with cancer. The wow. biggest charity in Europe is, uh, um, I think, oh, I've got the name of it anyway. They, they said to her, well, you know, we've never been able to reach children and you're doing it. Fantastic. Uh. The magazine talked about Sophie as Saint Sophie. That's uh. my daughter. Wow. My son is the most magical guy. He runs a band, he writes music, he mentors. He's an apps, he's a life coach and a mentor. His 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 uh, what is it? Mind mindfulness. Mindfulness, yeah. Uh. Um, and and he's an actor as well. Uh. And he's 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 an extraordinary man. He, wow. He's I'm so proud of both of them. They're wow. both luminous. Wow. And I, I, you know, I hadn't seen them a lot uh, because I took this path. If I'd have taken the path of just being retired and everything else, I could have probably left years and years ago and gone back to Europe and spent time with them. I've got a grandson who's nine months, who's going to be a year actually next month, and I've never seen him. Mm, I saw photos on Facebook. I, I want to make this, I want to make the, I look forward, not I want, I look forward to the charity becoming totally sustainable so yeah. that I can leave. I can say this publicly. I want to leave. I want to go back to Europe to spend time with my kids. Wow. My grandson. Wow. I want to do that. Wow. And, and I don't know whether I can do it in the next calendar year because of the pandemic, but I'm doing my damnedest. I've now got some fantastic people on board. Mm. Not from Sarah, we've got Andrew Boyle Andrew, from yes. Australia Volunteers International, who's fantastic, nine years or however many years with Red Cross, mm. uh, military and everything else. He's going to be taking over from me, I hope. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and I can work on the charity rather than in the charity. Wow. I've got a charity, we registered a charity in England called Soul Family, actually. Mm -hmm. Get away from this whole man. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason was Lynn Franks, I don't know if you've heard, yes. heard of Lynn Franks. Lynn yes. Franks was, they modeled absolutely fabulous on Lynn Franks, yeah. Well, Lynn, Lynn is a very close friend of mine, a fellow Buddhist. And I said, look, would you be a trustee of the charity if I form it in England? She said, are you mad? I'm one of the global spokespeople for women's empowerment. I couldn't support so men. Are you crazy? <laughs> a brilliant woman. Point. Quick as a fact. She said, if you register Soul Family, I'll be a trustee. Nice. So it took me a year, but we've done it. Ah, so when I go back to Europe, maybe I'll be able to do something for Soul Family. Soul Family at the moment collects money in, in England and Europe for us in Someone in Bali. Okay, moment of truth. Moment of truth, Robert, so I don't get, let you off the hook uh, in case this actually gets to the people that matter, including your kids. So what are the maybe one or two things you're most proud of about your son and your daughter that if they watch this video, you would love them to hear? And then the second is, what would you say in recording as to a date we can put in place for you to accomplish the goal of being there? Because I remember we did a little consultation together and it came up again that you want to spend time with your family and your grandchild. So let's uh, put it in some recording. Yeah, what's the ideal date that you'd like that to happen? And what are the things you'd like to say that you're most proud of your kids, that you tell them face to face, but we can start online? Okay. I think I'd like to be back within a calendar year. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
So I this time, know. this time next year. Yeah. Yeah. So fifteenth of April next twenty twenty two, she'll be in in England sending me a video, telling me. I like, think that's doable. I'm not going to start. I'm not going to stop doing the charity. I'm not going to run away from Solmen. I will continue because I can't do nothing. I'm that sort of person. Uh -huh. I wish I was. I wish I could sit and just read books. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not for as long as I've known you. So not possible. I think you're like that as well. But exactly. 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 I, I think engaged <laughs> is a better word now. And the other, the other question was, what, what, what makes? What would you like to tell them if they watch this video about what you're most proud of about both of them? individually in uh, each one individually uh, okay take sophie she's the oldest um she's 40 years oh god i shouldn't say that but she's 40 years old this year i am so unbelievably proud of what she's done um, what she's done with trek stock i you know i i, I cannot believe what she's done she, she's she's also helped so many people over the years um, and Uh, and, and she's the most fabulous mother. She's uh, brought up my grandson, Dylan, in a pandemic by herself when her husband had COVID. COVID. Wow, wow. Um, luckily, he's okay now. I'm deeply proud of her and wow. everything she does. Wow. And my son is, is just a jewel. He's the most, one of the most lovable people. You, 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 you can feel his presence when he walks into the room, he and his wife. And I, I just really, really am so proud of his achievements. He did two two-month tours of, of Bali, of, of, uh, of China with his band. Um, he's, oh, I think his, his, his mindful meditation Look up www.mindfulmeditation. You can see what he does. He does an amazing amount of work for people, um, helping people. And he's, he could have gone off in the music business and, and probably earned great money and everything else. He's a, I think he's earning good money doing his, his mindful meditation. And he, he's managed to uh, subsist this with acting. He's so low key. He's so opposite of me that way. <laughs> and I asked his, I kept asking him, what films are you doing? He wouldn't tell me. He said, oh, you wouldn't. You know, blah, blah, blah. I asked his wife and she said, well, he's just spent two months with Johnny Depp. Wow. Um, that's such a film. That's what? Okay. He never told me that. Wow. Ali, you didn't tell me you knew Johnny Depp. You were, oh, it was okay. And Idris <laughs> Elba and this one and that one. He, da, 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 da. he wouldn't tell me. He's, it's, he is right. so low key. I say nice. opposite of me. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Massive big hearts. So, and, and I'm so lucky as well. Sophie's husband, Rich, has got a massive big heart. It's, I'm so fortunate that she has found Rich, Rich and, and, and Hannah has found Ali, my son, because they're both couples are perfect couples, perfect role model couples. Wow. They're a joy to watch. And wow. it's, I'm only sad that I've been away for 20 years doing what I'm doing, but I, I'm the sort of person that gets involved in something, throws themselves into it, can't stop, got to keep going, got to reach the target and then go beyond or whatever it is. Uh, and and, and at, at the expense, I, I'm sorry, that I'm at the expense of my family and my uh, wife as well. Uh, I've, I've, I haven't been paying attention that I should. Anyway, it's not too late. I'm 72. I'm going to be 73 in October. I've it. still got plenty of time left. That's and I'll it. make it up to them. You know, at least you're acknowledging your ch your children and the amazing work they're doing. And I know, I hope to get you back on the show to talk about the other journey with uh, your life partner uh, that I have had the privilege of meeting. And I know how you're also making some meaningful contributions there. And this is something she told me on her own. So, uh, Robert, wanted to acknowledge you for that. But just a couple of few final questions so that... Uh, hopefully, if it's okay with you, we can get you back on the show. But before we do, kind of wrap this one up. Uh, you mentioned some accomplishments and what you're proud of of your children. What would you say are the three things you're most uh, proud of about yourself that you've accomplished in this journey called life? The founding soul man has got to take the, the top prize. Um, I've, I've had various achievements in the commercial world. I, I, I facilitated um, 
Virgin Megastores in Japan with Richard Branson, and I'm still in touch with him through that. Um, achievements. Uh, surviving the terrorist attack in Peru and surviving my lung cancer in KL last year. Yeah. I think those are my massive achievements. Wow. I can't think of anything else that would be more meaningful. Wow, wow. No, that's fantastic. And uh, just a couple of final others there. Um, what would you say, if anything, in your own behavior as a leader, looking back, that you really feel you're proud of, that you've mastered, that's really helping you significantly maybe make more impact, maybe have better connections or quality with your family? What are the behavioral changes that you've seen or made in yourself that you feel have been uh, ones you can point to to say this has really been a positive change in my character or behavior lately? One of the things is that I've, when I started the charity, I wanted it done my way. Not quite my way or the highway, but my way. I wanted to, if whatever I came up with, and very often I came up with some wacky ideas and perhaps it wasn't the right thing to do. Um, but I've learned now in the last few years, thanks a lot to Sarah Chapman's mentoring to actually uh, work it out democratically with with her and with the team and to not rush into things so quickly and say yes 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 all the time because i i have ta i have been taken advantage of many times actually i'm not embarrassed to say that by people who have taken advantage of me and my connections and, and so forth and so on and now I'm a little bit more wary and guarded. Um, and I, I tend to think a little bit more before I, before I leap. And uh, I think Sarah sleeps better at night. Yeah. That. <laughs> <laughs> That's good advice. I like that. Okay, last, last three questions. Uh, how do people actually reach you? And what's maybe the most exciting project someone is working on? that people maybe can search online and how do they find you through your website? So you have social media handles. What's, uh, what's exciting for you and how can people- Yeah, I think www.solman.org. Www, www www.solman.org. I could add slash donate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that. I went on there and it's all a really my, interactive site. All, really. all my WhatsApp is plus six two. Six four seven zero one nine four eight plus six two six four seven zero one nine four eight. I'm very happy to have WhatsApps. I, I, I'm not crazy about email. I get swamped. I know that. WhatsApp. Um, fine. Okay, great. Yeah. And what's that, what's an exciting project that you think some people might be interested to know? Fun facts about so many. Uh, I know we talked about a few of these in our relating, but uh, just things maybe people should be. Uh, interested to know about Solman at the moment? Well, we, we, we do have a five-year strategic plan. It's on our website. It's interesting if people have a look at that. Mm -hmm. And if there's any way they can help us, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be financially, you know, through brainstorming or through ideas or whatever. Go onto our website, have a look for our five-year strategic plan uh, and, and, and contact us mm -hmm. if you would like to volunteer or help in any way. We also need to get the word out. Uh, I need to reach um, a number of high net worth individuals that I can get to go, get to meet on virtually. Uh, 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 in the pandemic, but, you know, Napoleon Hill, who you, you'll have heard of. Yeah, thank you, Grosch. Wrote in 1935, um, in every disaster, there's always a seed of benefit. In every disaster, there's always a seed of benefit. I know what my seed of benefit was in my lung cancer, and that was seeing and being imbued with gratitude, which I am every day. I'm so grateful for virtually everything. I'm, I'm so grateful. I'm grateful to Sarah. I'm grateful to our team. I'm grateful for the whole thing. I'm grateful to my children. I'm grateful to you. Uh, and that, that's really 
so important to me. So gratitude, I would say to everybody, get hold of gratitude and and have gratitude for everything and you'll be a lot more happy. Wow, I love it. Two more final questions for you. I'm really enjoying this. So let's imagine now you're at the end of your time and I know you've got a lot, not long to go because you've got a grandson to play with. But let's just say you're finally, finally done. You're doing your last mantra and you really mean it this time because you want to see what's on the other side. Uh, but you're given a pen and paper <laughs> and you're not going to be cheated on death, but you're given a paper and someone says to you, please leave so your top three things that you love the world to remember you by. What would they be? So, man. Uh -huh. My two children. Yeah. Um, gosh, what will I be remembered by? What, basically, the legacy I've left in Bali, I suppose. Uh, uh. Right. Shelley. Shelley's been long suffering for the last 10, 11 years, putting up with me being away for long periods of time. Sarah and I've worked weekends for, for over a decade. We, you know, it's been it's been full on. Yeah. And I have not paid attention to my wife uh. for so long, and I need to actually put that right. Yeah, no, well said. And to my children, and to my children. Yeah. That, that's really, you know, attend to your family, attend to those plo closest to you. Because uh. if you can't attend to those closest to you, how can you attend to those outside of your inner circle? How yeah. can you, how can you be humanitarian if you're not actually attending to the people next to you? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's one big lesson just for me personally as well, if I may share. I may have lost the plot along the way, and I'm uh, trying to put it right. Uh, uh. And I definitely wish you many years of that, or at least more quantitative uh, experiences to bridge that gap. Um, so just wanted to take a, 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 a moment, uh, Robert, to acknowledge the man that you are, the amazing journey that you've been on, the amount of people you've actually impacted, and also... Uh, to say that you've probably, for me at least, from what I'm taking away from this conversation, really given life a good go and put your heart and soul into, and not just your soul feet, but your soul into everything that you've done. And I know from first-hand experience with the amount of people in the Indonesian Balinese community that rub shoulders with me and ask me if I know you and the positive things they follow on saying that you're doing for some communities that nobody wants to take notice of. I just want to do at the bottom of my heart to say I acknowledge you, I see you, and uh, you are the uh, chanting master as well. I've heard a lot about the positivity you brought and waking people up early hours and taking them to remote places. So this uh, has been such a beautiful uh, beacon of light that I've always also heard and followed since the first time I was here in, in Bali. And uh, you definitely built some amazing tribes around you. So I just want to acknowledge you for your great work. And I'm now wishing you all the very best with the inner work, with your inner circle uh, to make those uh, connections more solid and more qualitative. Uh, but yeah, so just want to say you're a great man and thank you for that. Thank you so much. I no, appreciate that. So just thank a you last... Thank the opportunity. And ah, yeah, yeah, anytime. No, we definitely want to go on board. So two more last questions or one more last question, I think. Uh, what is your definition of living a meaningful life? Confidence. I think I could sum it up in one word. Confidence. Uh, uh. If you're not confident in yourself, you can't help anybody else. You can't help yourself if you're not confident. And if you're not confident in yourself, you can't possibly help anyone. It doesn't work. Uh, so I think you can sum, I can sum it up in one word. Hmm. Confidence. I love that. And uh, just the last one. Is there any questions that you wish people asked about you that they don't ask that you wish they asked that uh, you'd like people to know about? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Mm, okay, I'll leave you to think about that till the next one, because sometimes people always ask the obvious ones, but maybe something that you wish people asked you about you that they should know about. So if that hasn't come to mind. Oh, I, I would like people to ask me 
for some of my experiences of how my chanting practice has helped me. Mm, mm, okay, I think we're going to do a hell of a song. Because I can help, I can help other people that way. Mm, mm, mm. I like that. I like that. All right, well, we'll, we'll call it a close here. Thank you so much for being part of this uh, journey and storytelling and some amazing adventures you've taken us on. I wanted to thank you again for being part of uh, Tribe Stories and hopefully we can get you back on the show and explore deeper into some of the questions on the chanting side of life. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Thank thanks you, for your time. Thank you. Great to meet up with you again. Oh, Wonderful. yeah. No, we're doing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers.